Welcome again to our webinar. This is a roadmap to employability, integrating higher order skills into curricula and assessment. And I am joined today by two awesome co-presenters, Johnny Key and Doug Mezikar. Johnny is a partner at Stratagos and the former Secretary of Education at Arkansas, Department of Education. And Doug is also a partner at the Stratagos Group and the former, a former Deputy Chief of Staff at the U.S. Department of Education. And I am Dora Zahner, the Chief Academic Officer for the Council for Aid to Education. So again, I'm joined today by Johnny Key and Doug Mezikar. And we're going to get started. So again, this is Roadmap to Employability, Integrating Higher Order Skills into Curricula and Assessment. But before we get started, a um, few things, learning objectives. At the end of the webinar, there are four things that we want you to have learned. How state and federal funding and policy can support the integration of higher order skills into construction, curricula, and measurement. To learn insights from the former Secretary of Education of Arkansas, that's Johnny, about how to design a K-12 educational system that truly prepares students for employability and entrepreneurship how higher order skills connect and complement content and knowledge, and innovative ways districts are teaching and measuring higher order skills across curricula. In your opinion, which of the following higher order skills is the most important for students to master? These are higher order skills that are above and beyond content expertise. More than half are saying critical thinking with communication as a second, 21%. And collaboration and creative problem solving are sort of tied. Great, thank you. So I'm going to pass this on to Doug now. He's going to talk about Future Ready Today and give us a global perspective of this idea that we're discussing. Yeah. Doris, thank you. And excited to be with you all here today. So I'm going to set the table for a lot of the discussion coming up. So my background has a lot to do with policy and funding and really understanding where some of the major trends in policy and funding are going in regards to employability in terms of getting students ready for their next step, higher order skills. And so one place to start, though, um, is, is really a question, right, um, in this slide. Are we preparing students for their next step? Whatever that may be, and their next step could be moving from eighth grade to ninth grade. It could be going to college or starting a job or going into the military. And it's interesting, I think, when you look at the, some of the national data, now, there's a lot of nuance in here, but at a high level, I think the answer is sort of. <laughs> We're sort of preparing students for their next step. So when you look at the percent of students who need to take some sort of remedial course when they enter higher education, and you can see here in community college and four-year college, the, the rates are a little bit different. But this is the idea, right, that students are not yet ready for college-level work. And now some of that's content related, but some of it's higher order skill related as well. They're not ready to take on the level of complexity and difficulty. And it really, I think, presents a question around our graduation rate has never been higher. Now, post pandemic, we've had a little bit of a dip, but it's high 80s. In some places, it's up over 90. And so I think what we see is a real disconnect here between the students who are graduating and their preparedness for their next step. And states are responding and districts as well. So Doris, if we could move on to the next slide and talk about at the federal level, there are a number of different ways in which federal funding and policy sort of play into this question around better preparing students, getting students ready with higher order thinking skills, the first one, and this is actually, um, I'm going back to the Every Student Succeeds Act. Um, that feels like kind of going way back in the time machine here, but it actually requires, and I have the quote on this slide, it requires higher order thinking skills and understanding uh, in state summative assessments. Um, it also, interestingly enough, allows for multiple different types of assessments, portfolios, projects, performance-based assessment, which we'll hear more about. 
These are all could be and frankly should be part of state assessment systems. Now, whether or not they are, Johnny, you may speak to this a little bit, is a different question in terms of how much states have incorporated higher order thinking skills, the ways in which they're asking for demonstration of mastery of those skills. And unfortunately, I think in most cases, it becomes a multiple choice question. Um, very few questions, if any, and they're multiple choice. And so um, there's not enough there, in my opinion. However, there's room for optimism there. I think the state of play is changing, and I'll talk about that in a minute. So some other federal policy, some states have pursued what's called the Innovative Assessment Demonstration Authority. And this was written into the Every Student Succeeds Act, and it allowed states to pursue really a different vision for assessment. Now, I will tell you, I think seven states signed up, and I believe there may be two or three left. Forgive me for not remembering exactly who they are. Um, but it's proven to be very challenging in implementation uh, in terms of how states were trying to use this innovative demonstration, uh, innovative assessment demonstration authority. So that hasn't proven to be super successful. However, I think the department is trying to figure out how to make that work better so more states can improve the type, the form, the content, everything about their assessment system, which would sort of encourage them to think about incorporating um, different ways of students can demonstrate mastery as well as those higher order thinking skills. The U.S. government, federal government through the U.S. Department of Education also gives out some grants through the competitive grants for state assessment program. Uh, and Georgia is a state that is using those dollars to really rethink their approach to assessment. So these are annual dollars. It's a competition that's run. States apply for the dollars and can use them to really rethink how they're approaching their state assessment. Um, I'm going to talk about stimulus funding. It's still out there. There's some left. Um, I'll tell you how much here in just a minute. And then last but not least, this is really interesting development. Within the last month, Montana received a testing waiver from the U.S. Department of Education to do what's called through-year assessment. So instead of a single summative state assessment, they're actually looking at assessing multiple times through the year and aggregating those results into a final score. Now, that doesn't necessarily get us to a performance-based assessment or higher order thinking skills, but what it does start to point toward is this growing movement toward moving away from a sort of single statewide summative assessment given at one time at the end of the year, largely multiple choice, largely kind of, a, if you will, an autopsy of what we or you know, students may or may not have learned. So I think what you're seeing is change amongst the states and even amongst districts around assessment, which ultimately I, I would argue is a positive thing. So I'm going to talk a little bit about, so where do we stand with stimulus spending? Well, we're almost at the deadline for ESSER 2. So we've passed the deadline for the CARES Act. That was ESSER 1. The deadline was September 30th of last year. The deadline for ESSER 2 is actually like in 11, 12 days. It's the end of September. And then the American Rescue Plan Act, the last fund, ESSER fund, that deadline is September 30th of next year. And ESSER 3 is the is the big one. That's the $122 billion. And you can see here, ESSER 1 is largely spent. I know it doesn't say 100%. That's mostly a lag in reporting. ESSER 2 is largely spent as well. You can see here, 84% of the dollars have been spent. The rest of those dollars have been obligated, which is federal speak for they're under contract. And so that leaves roughly half-ish of the American Rescue Plan Act dollars over the next year to be spent. Now, it is true a lot of those dollars have been accounted for or there's plans for those dollars, but that's still a lot of money, relatively speaking, um, that is that are out there. So when you think about how can this be done, you know, at the state level, at the district level, it isn't too late, although the clock is starting to tick ever louder on using stimulus dollars to perhaps begin a different approach to integrating higher order thinking skills into assessment or curricula. Doris, if we could keep going. 
Uh, I mentioned this timeline. Uh, the red bar is where we're at. Um, you know, we're about to enter into the new fiscal year for normal federal appropriations, Title I, Title II, et cetera. Um, although Congress seems to be having trouble once again with pants passing their annual federal appropriations. So we'll see where that ultimately lands. They will get the deal or a budget deal done, appropriations passed. Um, it's just going to be, I think, a little painful until we get there. So you can see here where we're at. We're kind of getting to the very tail end of the stimulus money, which, again, is hard to believe. But there are other federal dollars coming into play as well as state and local. And then, Doris, I'm going to end up on a couple of slides around what are states doing? So much more prevalent at the state level than at the federal level. Um, states are doing a bunch of different sort of approaches to how they're designing curriculum, how they're designing assessment, how they're putting this all together with different approaches. So you can see here on this slide, 29 states have some form of a competency-based education policy or requirement. And why is that important? Well, it begins to move us away from that sort of We've got standards, we've got assessments, we've got accountability, and we're looking at mastery just sort of in that very sort of sequential way where competency base can allow for the integration of higher order thinking skills into curriculum and assessment. So states are in different places with this, but I would call this a very positive development as we start to think about how do we incorporate competency based in ways that we haven't before. Um, Portrait of a graduate. Oh, if you go back, Doris, just one slide. So we had a, a, a little a beginning of a poll question. So portrait of a graduate, there are 16 states, and I, I'll show you that slide in just a minute. So this is the idea of what do graduates need to know and be able to do when they graduates, graduate? So it's this idea of, uh, in some states, it's called portrait of a learner, a graduate profile, but thinking beyond the standard We've got a diploma, we passed the state assessments, you know, and now we're ready to go. And it's it's this idea of incorporating more experiences. It could include career and technical education experiences, higher order thinking skills. And so states are moving toward this idea of rethinking, at least in high school, what it means to prepare students for their next steps. And if you look at any of these portrait of a graduate definitions or models that states have, they all incorporate a variety of these higher order thinking skills that we'll be talking more about. Um, a number of states are involved with the Council of Chief State School Officer Innovation Lab Network. So they're trying new innovations out. Six states are really diving deep on student-centered or personalized learning initiatives. And then one other to highlight in Missouri, 20 districts have gotten together um, and really have asked the state to rethink the approach to curriculum and assessment and really want to go down a competency-based path. So even within states, you see groups of districts wanting to approach standards, assessment, curricula in a different way. And then, Doris, just to put a visual to some of these numbers, if we go to the next slide. So this is the group of states. Now, if you don't see your state on there and you're knowing you're doing competency-based education, let me know, drop it in the chat. I'd love to add more states to this list, but this was uh, so a list from KnowledgeWorks, if you've ever heard of that group, that they compiled the different sort of state policies around competency-based education. So a lot more than you would think, and there is a lot here. Um, and then Doris, the last slide here. So portrait of a graduate is what we're gonna talk more about today. So 16 states, and this feels like a growing sort of uh, movement or there's growing momentum around putting this portrait of a graduate in place. Um, you, and some of this overlaps with the competency-based states, some, some do not. But it's, the, again, this idea of let's rethink high school and let's focus on some of these different skills, these different competencies that we want students to have when they take their next step. Um, but many lack a way of measuring. So we've got this rethinking, right? But how do we know that we're actually achieving the goals we set out for for these portraits? And many states, unfortunately, are still kind of in the 
we've got something written down, but we haven't implemented it quite yet. And so they're in different phases and stages. But I think overall, as you look at federal funding and policy, state funding and policy, there's really, I think, a movement toward how do we better prepare students? How do we leverage existing funding and policy to make this happen? And some of it is within the context of federal law. Some of it's very specific to state context. But there is a lot happening. And I think every day, more and more momentum is growing behind incorporating higher order thinking skills, rethinking assessment. How do we better prepare our students for their next step? So with that quick overview, Doris, I'm going to turn it back over to you and Johnny to sort of take it from here. So hopefully that gave you a, a landscape analysis of where we're at with some of these policies. Thank you so much, Doug. Excellent and very informative um, and I think useful. We have a question coming up, but we'll get to that at the end regarding um, Portrait of a Graduate. So Johnny, you're up for a state leader's perspective. Well, thank you, Doris. And I um, want to thank CAE for uh, sponsoring this and uh, the support uh, from, uh, from Ed Webb. It's, uh, it's exciting to be a part of this conversation. While Arkansas was not, uh, as you just saw, one of those uh, states that had officially adopted a portrait of a graduate, uh, certainly the concepts of higher order thinking, uh, those concepts were at the center of many of our conversations. In 2016, uh, we kicked off a brand new uh, mission and vision and uh, for the department, and it was to help create uh, a, a, a state that supported student-centered education. And uh, a lot of that is happening in pockets. Uh, Arkansas is, as many as most states are, considered local control states. Uh, so a lot of what we see happening in Arkansas was really generated at the local level. So I'm going to talk about some of that today. Uh, but here's the challenge. The challenge for all of us is to create greater learning opportunities for all students whether they are rural students, whether they are minority students, whether they are students with disabilities, um, whatever they come to our schools with, it is our responsibility. Uh, we must make learning relevant and uh, students need to see the application of content knowledge. Uh, and my son taught me this. Uh, I'm actually joining from his apartment in Brooklyn today. Uh, IRL. He texted me that one day and I, I thought, uh, what does that mean? And he had to explain to me that means in real life. So kids need to see IRL in real life. What does the math, the literacy, the science, what are those things that they are learning? What, what does that really mean for them and for their future? And we as adults must create those pathways. Uh, they need to start early. Uh, they must be diverse. They, they, they need to reach that and be inspirational for all learners. So not every student is going to be excited by the same thing, but uh, as state leaders, as local leaders, as classroom teachers, building leaders, it's our responsibility to find what those sparks are uh, for our students. And I think it's important that they have vertical progression as some of the examples that I'll talk about in a moment uh, are, are great at various levels, whether elementary level or middle level or secondary level. But unless a student can see that pathway to move on to that next learning opportunity, uh, sometimes we're, we're cutting it short for them and selling them short on what uh, education can really be. Uh, what are some of those opportunities that we can create for all students? And I'll give you some examples uh, from my my children, who are now out of the public school system, uh, in uh, you know, out in in real life again, uh, but uh, creativity and steam. You know, what are those things that can spark their interest? Uh, Odyssey the mind, for example, destination imagination, and a relatively new one that's uh, called e cyber mission. Um, my children experienced Odyssey the mind. It really helped them with that higher order thinking of creativity, getting along, because if you have ever been involved in any of those types of programs, you know that uh, the, the students are supposed to take the lead. It develops student agency. It gives them an opportunity to learn how to work together in stressful situations. Uh, robotics, uh, there are opportunities out there such as VEX, uh, FIRST Robotics, 
And in uh, my hometown, where uh, I began my uh, professional career in Mountain Home, Arkansas, uh, the, the facility where I worked, actually, our engineers worked closely with the school and with the students and were the coaches for the first robotics team. The robotics engineers uh, at the, the facility actually became the coaches working with those students, working with those teachers uh, on their first robotics team. Uh, was a great community collaboration. And then we also know that economics and entrepreneurship are, are great ways to develop those higher order skills, uh, preparing those students, not just to be uh, employees of the future, but to be the innovators, to be the creators, to be those thinkers that help us move forward and, and create the new technologies, the new pathways uh, for, for future growth. And in Arkansas, we relied heavily on Economics Arkansas, which is uh, under the umbrella of the Council for Economics Education nationally. Uh, it's very likely that in your state, you have a branch and I would encourage you to reach out, find out who that is in your state. Uh, NIFTY. Uh, NIFTY is the Network for Teaching Economics. It's another great national uh, nonprofit organization, uh, but support teachers and uh, through professional development opportunities. And then uh, our career uh, technical student organizations, a vital component of that vertical progression that I mentioned before. Uh, if you're coming up through middle elementary school and middle school, uh, in any of these programs or any of these opportunities, you want to see an opportunity to grow into something else. And uh, FBLA, uh, FFA, FCCLA, you know, C, uh, career technical student organizations are certainly the alphabet soup of acronyms. Um, but uh, the Future Business Leaders of America, Future Farmers of America, uh, those aren't just for rural kids or small town kids. Those opportunities are uh, across the board. And uh, we have found districts that have made great strides in uh, encouraging students to come into those. And one of the greatest uh, growth areas that we've seen uh, are in the area for uh, uh, having future teachers. Um, the Educators Rising program uh, that is part of Phi Delta Kappa, they, they, we have seen a, a tremendous growth. And, and in those opportunities, again, providing that, uh, that, that pathway uh, to create those higher order, enhance those higher order skills. How do we get there? I think it's imperative that we engage the community. Community partnerships to get to where we want to be are essential. And it's, uh, it's obviously the business and industry, our cultural organizations uh, in various parts of, of our states and in our cities, our faith-based organizations, uh, they need to be at the table and then the state and local uh, and uh, federal government entities, partnerships that we created through uh, our Arkansas Game and Fish Commission. They have an arm, they have an education arm at the, Ar the Game and Fish Commission. Many states have similar uh, programs within their uh, state uh, wildlife conservation, whatever it's called in your state. They probably have educators uh, that create opportunities for learning and collaboration. Uh, the state and local governments, there are historical societies, there are uh, cultural societies in those localities. I would encourage you to reach out and connect with them because they create those relevant learning opportunities uh, for students. And in that collaborative communication, it's not enough uh, just to say, well, you know, we're going to partner with the area chamber of commerce and go attend some meetings uh, a few times a year. It has to be more than that. There has to be meaningful dialogue with those entities. Um, ask them what their expectations are. If you're looking to create a, a, some type of uh, uh, work opportunities for students, internships, externships, those types of things, the school, uh, the, the school, the, the school leadership can ask them what type of uh, learning do you think they need? What type of skills do they need? Uh, to be successful. I think regardless of industry, regardless of the type of business, you're going to see some commonalities and it's those things that we are talking about today. And then share your standards. You know, the language between uh, community organizations, business organizations and schools, uh, they don't all, we don't always use the same terms, but they're often terms that overlap in their meaning. And so when we share the information of what uh, our standards are in education versus what their needs are, 
and have that conversation to be ongoing and collaborative, we can find common ground that helps us move forward those opportunities for kids. And then celebrate success. Uh, one of the hardest things to do uh, consistently is to celebrate success. And that doesn't mean a year in party. That means ongoing through the process, celebrate, find those opportunities to celebrate the success of, of a student, a class of students, a group of students, a school, and share those opportunities with your community. I'm going to give you some examples of some schools in Arkansas that have done a great job with this. Uh, and Batesville, Arkansas is a rural school district in Northwest Arkansas. Uh, I mean, sorry, uh, Northeast Arkansas, uh, Batesville, Southside School District. Uh, they created a partnership with their White River Area Chamber of Commerce, uh, along with a local community college, uh, with local manufacturers. If you've heard of Bad Boy Mowers or Spartan Mowers, they uh, one of the becoming the one of the largest producers of of uh, lawn equipment in the U.S. Uh, right there in a small town in Batesville, Arkansas, in their White River Health System. Uh, they created the Project Future Story. And uh, hopefully you'll be able to access these links, but uh, put a link in there to learn more about what that looks like. But on an ongoing basis, they bring all of the community business leaders, community leaders, city leaders, and work as mentors. Um, they have opportunities for um, interviews, student interviews that sometimes lead to uh, unpaid internships or paid internships. And it's not just the high school kids. It's not just the juniors or seniors that participate in this. It is uh, all the way down to the elementary level because they start early with thinking in terms of what my uh, future story looks like as a student attending the Southside School District. So that's one example. Another example are the Springdale Schools of Innovation. The Springdale School District is in Northwest Arkansas. Uh, recently, in the last few years, has become one of the largest school districts in the state. And they've created two schools uh, using waivers from uh, the State Department of Education to create schools of innovation, where they have personalized and accelerated learning opportunities, uh, not just in you know, career technical areas, but also in the arts, in the business and post-secondary partnerships so that students can learn, earn uh, credentials, not just hours toward higher education, but also certif certificates and other credentials that can help them in the workplace. They set pro uh, clear expectations and with the students and the parents and the community using proficiency scales, uh, so not the standard grading model, uh, that uh, we're all accustomed to. And they also focus on student agency. They put students in charge of their own learning. And at the most recently opened J Jim D. Rollins School of Innovation at the elementary level, they're using age appropriate elements of that, those same concepts and implementing those at the elementary level uh, with personalized and project-based learning. And then uh, the, and I saw, I want to call out Ms. Stafford. I saw uh, Ms. Stafford popped up uh, there from C uh, Central High School in the Little Rock School District. And I want to brag on the Little Rock School District and the other area schools in uh, Pulaski County, the Little Rock area, because they have recently partnered and created the Academies of Central Arkansas. Uh, it is in, in partnership with Ford Next Generation Learning. And they have created some opportunities uh, for students in all of the high schools in Little Rock, North Little Rock, Pulaski County, and Jacksonville. Uh, that, and I have a short video that introduces what they are doing there. Do you remember sitting in a science class asking, when am I ever going to need to know this? Or wondering why you were spending so much time learning how to solve a quadratic equation? For years, high school education has been taught in a way that is disconnected from the real world. Students are being asked to learn concepts without knowing the relevance of what they were learning, without knowing why. There must be a better way to make high school more engaging and more relevant. Imagine a career-themed education that connects real-world application to core academics, that prepares students not only for college, but for careers and life. Education that gives high school students opportunities to gain real-world experience, professional skills, and a jump start to their futures. 
That new way is called Ford Next Generation Learning, and it's coming to Pulaski County. Ford NGL uses the power of workplace relevance and business relationships to excite young people about education and to prepare them for success in college, careers, and life. Ford Next Generation Learning is a framework to transform teaching and learning that will soon be introduced in all high schools in the Little Rock, North Little Rock, Pulaski County Special, and Jacksonville North Pulaski School Districts. The first part of the framework is a transformation of teaching and learning within the classroom, creating meaningful, relevant learning that allows students to become lifelong learners and sets them up for success after graduation, whether they go straight to college or into a career. The second part transforms the high school experience by creating and maintaining career-themed academies and establishing the collaborative culture, structures, and practices necessary for small learning communities. At full implementation, this model will provide an academy home for all students in all high schools across the county. Teachers who collaborate and plan across disciplines bring project-based learning to all students in their academy. The third part transforms and strengthens business and civic engagement between the schools and area employers, post-secondary institutions, and community leaders. These partnerships ensure that students have the resources and support to prepare them for the future of work, filling our community with graduates who are lifelong learners. So what does this mean for parents, students, and their teachers? In this new way of learning, math, English, science, and social studies are taught through a career-themed lens leading to stronger core academic achievement. Students will also have the opportunity to earn college credits while still in high school and earn industry-recognized credentials. Before they graduate, students will attend a career exposure exhibition, participate in a job shadow, and intern with partner businesses and or complete a capstone project. In this new model, teachers will work in professional learning communities or PLCs with support from their peers, school administrators, business experts, and community leaders. Teachers within a PLC will all have the same students in their classes, giving them the opportunity to collaborate on providing personalized learning to students they all share and relevant lesson plans to students with common interests. What does this mean for our communities here in Pulaski County? Being part of the Ford NGL network provides many benefits as we work together to transform our high schools and improve student outcomes. Ford NGL career-themed academies exist in more than 40 other communities across the country, and we can learn from their implementations and take the best practices of their plans and apply them to ours. We have access to their expertise, curriculum, and innovative approaches to education to guide us through the planning process and beyond. Most importantly, this effort represents an opportunity for diverse community stakeholders to partner with education professionals to create public schools that work for all students. This is an exciting moment for Pulaski County as we work together to craft our unique Ford Next Generation Learning Plan. We can't wait to see the impact it has on our students and their families, our schools, our businesses, and our communities. So uh, it gives you a little taste of what we are doing in Arkansas. Uh, As you see, very different examples uh, in uh, in very different parts of the state. But the commonality is there are community groups and educators who are coming together to create those better, those relevant, uh, those advanced learning opportunities for our students. Here's the missing piece. Uh, As we, as in eight years that I was Uh, the head of uh, the Department of Education in the state of Arkansas, something we grappled with all the time. It fits into what Doug talked about with ESSA uh, regarding the uh, school quality and student success measure that's allowed in our state accountability system. How do we measure the success of these programs? And that's where Doris and the work that she does uh, comes into play. So Doris, I'm going to kick it back to you. Thanks, Johnny and Doug. Um, So yeah, the missing piece, there are portraits of a graduate, portraits of learner, uh, graduate profile developed, and they typically are very beautiful um, and ambitious infographics. But how do you actually measure these higher order skills? And this is what I'm going to show and talk about. So there are two things that I'm going to basically be discussing and showing. Uh, But before we do that, I want to run another poll question. I want to know if you are measuring your students' higher order portrait of graduate skills, how are you doing so? This is kind of telling. There's there's 
two responses so far, three responses out of everybody about it's if you're teaching these, how are you doing so? Embedding it in coursework is winning by a lot, by a long shot. Um, yeah, very, very interesting. And it, it doesn't, it, perhaps you, um, and this is like, this is a, a deliberate a, a, a attempt at teaching this. So most, most participants here are saying that this is part of the embedding in the coursework. Okay. Thank you. I'm going to close the poll. Um, and then the second poll question we have, if you're teaching, oh, if you're measuring them, so you're teaching them was the first question. If you're measuring them, how are you doing this? And if you're saying other, integrated performance instruction assessment tasks. If you're, if you're using other, type into the chat how else you're measuring these skills. So this is very interesting. The large majority was of uh, the participants on this webinar are using embedded, embedding this in teaching, and it looks like it's a relatively equal mix of how they're assessing classroom observation, classroom assessment, summative assessment, student survey, or other. Working impact assessment platform. Very interesting. OK, so now what I'm going to do is talk about why these skills are important. So Doug set the stage at a very high federal level. Johnny gave us a state view and some specific examples of how this is being um, done, but why are these important? So the research that my colleagues and I have done over the years show that students who have higher performance of these higher order skills tend to have higher cumulative GPAs by the time they graduate from their university or college. And they also tend to have better post university outcomes, meaning after they've graduated, as measured by employment, salary, graduate school enrollment, as well as their employer ratings or their likelihood of getting um, a promotion or a raise. So we know that these skills are tied to better outcomes in a positive way. But how can we measure these skills? So this is something that we would argue at CAE should not be done using a multiple choice assessment. And so what we do is we have an assessment that is a performance based one that uses a real world scenario. It puts students in a situation that they would encounter in the real world, whether if it's for high school students um, as part of the student council or an internship um, or if they're in middle school, even if they, they belong to some kind of club where they have to make a decision. And then they're asked to recommend a solution. So just like in the real world, the assessments that we have there's no single answer that would be correct. There are lots of nuances to having a solution to a problem, and we measure them on their decision and how they back up their decision and justify with evidence that's provided in this performance task that has multiple documents. So there are several documents and every performance task that a student sees, and they vary in terms of the type of information they get, whether it's a research report or a newspaper article or sometimes opinion pieces, and they can use the evidence in these documents in order to make the decision that they're given. And there is no single right answer, as I said, um, and there are pieces of information we're also looking for data literacy and information literacy if they have these skills, because some pieces of information, for example, if it's just some kind of web discussion board and the students are using that as evidence to back up their decision, that student has less um, information literacy than someone who actually understands that it's a research report by a scientist that has been published. We score them on our rubric, ranging from one through six for analysis and problem solving. So that's the critical thinking problem solving aspect of this higher order skill set. And then on their writing skills, so communication. So how effectively do they write and how well do they write? With, do they adhere uh, to the standards of written English? We then issue um, a student report. Actually, sorry, this 
uh, a student report where they get detailed information um, on how they do in terms of their total score and their subscores, as well as how they compare to their peers within their school and then across all the schools within the United States, all the students within the United States who have tested with us. This is a very general high level critical thinking that's considered to be domain agnostic. So we don't, they don't have to have any specific content knowledge of math, science, ELA, or social studies to do well. Everything is provided to them. But you can also assess these skills in a content specific way. And I'm gonna show you an example of that. So we partner with the New York City Department of Education, which is the largest school district in the United States on developing performance-based assessments for their, it's called the Office of Periodic Assessment. So it's the non-summative group. And these are performance tasks that teachers can use and opt to use in the classroom that measures science, social studies, ELA, and math, but the higher order skills within each of these content areas. So the scenarios are based, this is an earth science example that I'm showing you. And this was actually um, developed with Hurricane Sandy from 2012 in mind, because we want to make sure that all of the information that the students are seeing within New York City is relevant for that, stu that student population. So we wouldn't necessarily run a Hurricane Sandy um, type of performance task about you know, a, a, an island sinking if you were in a district in uh, Missouri, for example, because you know you don't have islands that sink into the ocean in the middle of the country. So again, we also we always try to make this context appropriate for the students. So the first one is explain reasons why New York City is sinking and use evidence from the text graphics to support your answer. So the students receive texts and graphs for all of the different sections. And this is a five part performance task. The second part talks about sinking lands and rising sea. So again, bringing more scientific concepts to the students and then asking them to make a judgment about the data that they're seeing for this particular earth science task. How quickly are parts of New York City sinking and which factors are uh, contribute? Then they're given additional information that might contribute to the sinking and, and coastal flooding, which, uh, sorry, which is about coastal flooding. So what happens, and if you look at the diagrams um, that, and the text that they're given, evaluate which areas of New York City are most vulnerable to sea level rise and land subsidence um, in here. So what's gonna happen in the next century and describe the factors that you consider in this evaluation. So now the students are asked to evaluate. Then the next part is about finding a solution. So we know that there are issues with um, rising sea levels and sinking land. So what would be a solution, a viable solution for this problem? And they're presented with different types of solutions and they have to pick one that would be best given the location that they have and explain why. And then the last part, so again, like I said, this is a five part task. The last part um, asks them to integrate all of the information and, uh, and make a claim um, about that engineering solutions, for example, are the best and why. So they have to then integrate and, and synthesize all of the first four parts into their argument for or against the claim that engineering solutions are the best. So assessment by itself is insufficient. And one of the things that we've looked at is how do we integrate curriculum that has very a lot of innovation and you know using these higher order skills. We just saw in the poll that we, we had that many of the instructors and, and educators here are using embedding this in the classroom as part of the curriculum. But how do you know that it's effective? And we have to have measurement as the other piece of it. So it goes hand in hand. So this is a model that's been used in um, higher education. So this is with Texas A&M University for their undergraduate business school. And what they've done is they've started with this idea of assess, teach, uh, improve, and assess again. So all of their entering students have they take an assessment on critical thinking to see how well they are to establish where their level of competency is. Then in the classroom, as part of the exercise of, uh, with, the, with the professors, they review their reports from the assessment that they took, and they look at ways in which the students can then improve. And then there's instruction. So there's support materials for the students to specifically improve and deliberately teach this 
in the context of an intro business class. So there are modules that teach critical thinking uh, with respect to supply chain and finance and accounting. So it's all embedded in content. Uh, these critical higher order skills are embedded in the content of the instruction itself. Then the students are allowed to practice and apply these skills using a performance task um, through these assignments over several weeks. And then they're reassessed to make sure that their skills have improved as a result of the instruction. And there was a short little study that my colleagues and I did where there were students who received the instruction for one set of classes and they didn't. And those who received the instruction actually did significantly better um, in terms of increasing their critical thinking skills than those who didn't, which is not surprising, but to go out and deliberately um, teach and then deliberately measure gives you the evidence that you need to show that the students are indeed uh, improving. So last poll question, what is or what would be the greatest challenge to teaching or learning and or measuring these skills? Last time, that came out very fast. <laughs> last time is, um, The biggest challenge. Interestingly enough, nobody so far has actually said budget. Hmm, great. It looks like mostly for class time, um, almost half of the participant respondents are saying class time. And about almost 30% are saying time to create the materials. So between the two, it's really a large proportion. So now we're gonna open this up to question and answer. Um, I think, let's see, there are some questions in here. Specifically, there's a question that came out for, I think for you, Doug, Ohio is one of the states. I, I don't know if it's in reference to portrait of a graduate or competency-based education state. Ohio is one, but why haven't I heard about it? <laughs> <laughs> That's a great question. Yeah. Um, I, I, I'm not sure I can answer that exactly, but um, I know, so one group that's been especially active, particularly in the portrait of a graduate space, is Patel for Kids, um, based in Ohio. You may have heard of them. Um, I would encourage you to to look at their website. Um, and it could be, too, and Johnny, you may have an opinion on this. Um, Ohio has had a lot of change uh, at the at the state chief level. And whenever there's a lot of change, they've had an acting um, commissioner of education. Um, sometimes the communication of, of what the state may be doing is, is not where it should be as, as the team isn't fully in place. And so I would think um, as Ohio kind of gets a permanent person in place and kind of sorts out how they're, they're sort of running their state department of education, um, I would expect you would hear more about that, but I, I actually think a lot of what's happening in Ohio is is coming from Patel for Kids and and some from some of these other organizations out there. Johnny, I don't know if you have any insights on Ohio, but uh, um, that that's a tough question to answer. <laughs> you know, it's it's a tough question, and, and honestly, yes, the Secretary of Education in Arkansas. There are probably initiatives that uh, if if someone from Arkansas heard about them and they said, well, Arkansas you know, is one of the states doing this, and they very well might say, well, I haven't, I heard about this. So it, it is, sometimes at the state level, it is hard to communicate effectively uh, all of the good work that is going on at the state level, especially when, you know, your state leadership is, is uh, interim uh, status. Uh, Dr. Woolard, uh, at the department now, interim uh, superintendent. He, he's been with the department a long time. I think he gets it and he'll do a good job of, of getting that information out. And, uh, and uh, you know, I think, uh, but but part sometimes it's just a matter of pick up the phone and call. I mean, I always encouraged uh, educators, superintendents, uh, building leaders. I said, look, if you have a question, 
uh, about what's going on at the state level in Arkansas, call us. Just, you know, we, we tried to be very open. We tried to create a, an atmosphere of uh, a collaboration. And uh, knowing the leaders that I know at Ohio, I think that's the, the feeling they have as well. Great. Thank you. Um, it doesn't look like there are other questions that came through. There's a comment that says integrated real world applications internships. Um, but I'm not really sure what that is. If you if you put that comment into the Q&A box, um, is there actually a question related to that that would be we could answer? Regarding I think that was a response to one of the poll questions. Got it. Got it. Okay. So that's Pop not a question. There. Um, no more audience questions. Any other final thoughts then for Doug? Uh, well, for me, I, I think we've got real examples of how to do it. Um, I know class time as a premium, as we just saw in our last poll. But I, I think the, the challenge for us and, and Doris, maybe, maybe I'm answering a question and asking one all at the same time. I, I don't think this has to be viewed as yet another thing to be done in the classroom. I think it's a thinking about how can we build this into what we currently do to extend it, to deepen it. Um, and, and, you know, it, it really can transform, I think, how we approach curriculum and assessment. And so, I, I'm very sensitive to that. There's not enough hours in the day. There's a lot of things on educators' plates and that this not just be one more thing that has to be done on top of everything else. But um, Doris and, and Johnny, too, with the examples you gave in Arkansas, it, it feels as though it can be done in ways where it, it's integrated in and not just added on top of. So I, I don't know if you have thoughts about how to make that work from a very practical perspective. Well, I, I would just say in Arkansas, the uh, we have the opportunity uh, through a number of legislative initiatives through the year years to grant waivers uh, from certain requirements. So the question about do we add something on? Well, look at locally at what are those things that you're doing that are not value added? They may be state res, uh, requirements, and if they are, uh, and if they get in the way of doing something. Uh, innovative like this, uh, see if your state has a way to approach the state board for a waiver. Uh, or, you know, in, in some cases, it's just a matter of, uh, I know the local leaders, uh, Dr. Debbie Jones in Bentonville tells me about, you know, her conversations and challenging her leaders, her building leaders say, we're doing something because we've always done it and it's getting in the way of what's good for kids. Let's stop doing it and do what's good for kids. So these conversations aren't just state level conversations. They really sometimes are best uh, initiated at that local level. Thank you. Two more questions just came in. One is about um, the role, uh, the route, sorry, for students entering the military. Do either of you have experience with this? Um. Can you say a little bit more? I'm not quite sure what the question it is. It just says, what has been the route for students entering the military? Maybe in terms of learning these higher order skills? So I, I can speak to that uh, because one of the uh, partnerships that we had was with the Little Rock Air Force Base, which is actually a misnomer because it's not in Little Rock, it's in Jacksonville. Uh, <laughs> but uh, the school districts in that area, Jacksonville, Cabot, uh, the Pulaski County School District, they have great partnerships and bringing uh, those partnerships with the, the base personnel into the schools and, and school personnel onto the bases to find out what those opportunities are. And when you think about the technology that's used in the military today, drone technology, uh, the, the high tech, um, not just weaponry, but monitoring of, of our of borders, of our coastlines, all of those things that uh, the military is responsible for. Uh, there are great opportunities for students and the higher order skills definitely is what, you know, that's something the military leaders are looking for. Uh, so especially if you have a base or, uh, uh, you know, some type mm -hmm. of military installation, they should have an education person uh, designated, uh, reach out and find out who that is and, and initiate a conversation. 
Thank you, Johnny. And one other question came in. Um, well, two, one, one is whether the assessment is available. Yes, so please visit our website or contact me. And the second one is, could this be used as remote learning? And I think absolutely. These are the types of skills that does, don't necessarily have to be um, you know, in the in-person classroom, you can absolutely do this. The assessments that we're talking about are specifically, um, they're delivered online and these are higher order skills. So they're not even used in a paper and pencil uh, classroom. So I think it would adapt very well for remote learning. Um, thank you, everybody. This is about, we're about at the end of our uh, hour. So if, again, if you have questions or want to learn more about these assessments that I discussed, you can visit our website at cae.org. Thank you, everyone, for attending, and we look forward to seeing you again on our next webinar. Have a great day. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, everybody.